Hello all, welcome to another episode of The Manly Catholic. This is James, your host, and I'm very excited for this conversation here with Dr. Dan Schneider. Uh, the first time we talked with him, it was with Father Dom and myself, and we talked about his uh, new book, The Libra Cristo Method, which we will be touching on again here uh, in this interview that I had with him. It was just me interviewing him. And silly me, I uh, forgot to start the recording right when we got going. So you're going to be jumping into a bit of into the conversation. Context is, uh, in the intro I mentioned, we are speaking about uh, Jesus today primarily uh, is our topic, but in particular, the kind of misconceptions that our culture has had about Jesus, you know, he's all about mercy and um, sort of this I don't want to say hippie Jesus, but kind of a, a misconception of who Jesus really was. And Jesus was actually very radical, especially in how he perceives himself and what he calls us to do. He really calls us to live a transformative and radical life. And I think a lot of us miss that where, you know, again, the mercy is emphasized, but then often in his miracles, he talks about, you know, go and sin no more or your faith has saved you. So it, it's a uh, it's amount of uh, activity on our part. Obviously, Jesus is merciful, of course, and God's the only one that can provide that mercy, but we also have to do something on our part. So you'll hear Dan talk often about, you know, there's no sugary Jesus. And then when he jumps in, he's talking about a passage in Mark 3 um, when Jesus is uh, crowded around and he basically goes into, um, he was so, because he was, Jesus was such a radical figure, he literally changed the, changed the world that so many people were crowding around him that he could hardly lift up. Uh, his his cup of coffee was his reference there. So just want to give you a little bit of context and background. Um, again, I messed up and did not hit the record button, but just, again, that's the context going in as we jump in. I uh, thank you so much for listening. Please hit that subscribe button if you are watching on YouTube. Uh, hit that subscribe button if you are listening to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and please help share the word. And before I keep rambling on, conversation with Dan Schneider. God bless. being accused by the by the by the jewish leaders of driving out demons by the prince of these guys the pagans and it says that they were so cr they crowded him in so much he couldn't even eat it says i mean we we missed those. we just kind of gloss those over and go to the big stuff he was so powerfully popular that he couldn't even grab his coffee and pick it up that they were packing in wanting they were wanting to hear every single word you know and and a sugar and you know what I promise you he didn't have perfect hair gel and he wasn't wearing skinny jeans he didn't have the perfectly cropped beard I mean he was a manly guy and he and that masculinity drew people and he, and, and it, what drew the most I think was his clarity his clarity uh, 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 and, and speaking direct and forthright uh, in a charitable way but very direct and forthright yeah and gosh I mean there there's so much to just to the context of of the the time period that he lives in, I think often, especially now in in the twenty first century, we, we forget about you know what happened two thousand years ago when Jesus was alive. You know the time period, what was going on, the context, and you know how radical his teachings were. You know, especially when we mentioned uh, um, uh, exorcisms that that you mentioned here, and I know you're writing a, a follow up book about. Uh, from the Libra Cristo method, kind of diving more into that. But I, I do want to touch on that a little bit because that, especially Mark, Mark's gospel is the action packed gospel, you know, and he, he talked, I mean, I don't know how many exorcisms Jesus actually did. I don't know if you have a number on off the top of your head, but this was paramount to his ministry. And, you know, I think two people often mistake, well, you know, nowadays we know a lot of it is mental illness, which I mean, clearly mental illness was around back then as well. But Jesus was the son of God, so I think he could identify the difference between a true possession versus, you know, a true mental mental illness. And, you know, what, what often gets mistaken is when Jesus, because Jesus is, is thought of, you know, Jesus is love, you know, God's all about love. And of course he is, but whenever Jesus radically transformed somebody's life, whether it was healing a blind man or healing the woman who had the hemorrhaging for a number of years— he always followed the healing with go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. That was always present his follow up. To the Pharisees. Yeah. Present yourself. Yeah, and, not to the Pharisees, to the priest. Yeah. Right. And it, there's always that follow up. And people seem to, to forget that. 
that part is that Jesus is all about love and mercy. And again, of course he is, but you know, he's also the God of the old Testament, which I know a lot of people have problems with is the God of the old Testament, you know, the ultimate justice. And maybe we can dive into that a little bit too, that correlation, Dan, between the God of the old Testament and God of the new Testament, who's Jesus, obviously. And yes, he's that merciful figure, but he also ultimately is calling us to life of transformation which a lot of us don't want to do because we're, we're stuck in our comfort. We're stuck in our ways, especially, you know, both of us live in the United States, a lot of comforts here in the U S which we can just see with the crazinesses of our culture. When we get too comfortable, our minds think, Oh, we don't really need God. We don't really need this, this figure from a long time ago, or, Oh, that's just kind of old tradition. And we don't need Jesus anymore. We're more sophisticated than that. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting is you mentioned this God of the Old Testament. There were two principal heresies around the Old Testament in the early church. You had Marcionism, um, the followers of Marcion, and and they were they they fell into the same error. This God of the Old Testament is co- completely contrasted to the to the God of the New Testament, and so they allowed they took some of the Gospels and some of the writings of Paul, but they dismissed the Old Testament completely um, because that that God they couldn't reconcile. That, that with the with with what the teachings of Jesus, and then you had the Ebionites or the Judaizers that wanted to keep all the old rituals, um, ceremonies, circumcision, and other things. They couldn't they couldn't get into how uh, the transition from old into new, from from letter to spirit to spirit, from 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 the earthly to the heavenly, from the the the, the sacramental. They couldn't they couldn't bridge make that make that make that step. But if you look at that God's first self revelation. In the Old Testament, he reveals himself, well, of course, as the I am, right, to Moses. And then after the deliverance of, of, of the people of God through the Exodus and through the parting of the sea, Moses writes a poem and he says, God is a warrior. Lord mm-hmm. God Almighty is his name. Was first, so the first title that, he's, that he proclaims is God is a warrior. This phrase, when you hear, when you hear the Lord of hosts, the Lord God Almighty, those are, those are translations of, of, this, of the God of hosts, of the heavenly host, the God who, who, who directs and commands the heavenly armies and, 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 and gives a, 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 a and, and defeats the, the, the cosmic enemies of the people of God um, and intervenes in, in human history for his people, the God of hosts, the God of the armies, the, the God, Lord God Almighty. This phrase is, this, this title for God is used 185 times in the Old Testament. And, and this, the concept of a warrior God. And, and it is. And then we again, we get a picture of Jesus now from a lot of our homilies and, and, and popular media. Oh, he's a nice guy. He's a sugary Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Then look to Revelation 19. Jesus is not sitting there on, on, you know, he's not sitting at a bus stop with a little latte and a perfectly groomed beard and, and you know, and it's smelling like like hair gel, perfectly groomed. You know what I mean? He's sitting on, on top of a war horse and the war horse. You know, the the imagery from the Old Testament, from Job and other places, the battle horse, right? The war horse that 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 grunts in anticipation of going into battle. Jesus is sitting on that. A sword comes out of his mouth. The warrior God comes back in judgment. So we, we've lost sight of that. Uh, um, and so and so part of that is, is, you know, uh, you asked a question about how much exorcism is in the New Testament. Father, Father Ripperger has noted that's uh, up to 20. 20 25 percent 24 percent about a quarter of the gospels um focus on this if you look at the gospels the gospel themselves especially in mark's gospel if if you had an actor that played the gospel of mark the jesus gospel of mark it would it would have to be like the old clint eastwood jesus is a gunslinger in mark's gospel i love mark's gospel i mean i did five years six years of research on the gospel of john which is fantastic but then I've now gone into Mark for this present manuscript I'm working on. And the Jesus of Mark that is presented by Mark is just, this is a very matter of fact, masculine Jesus. And so he, he starts off his ministry in Mark chapter one, doing three things. And this pattern repeats itself um, uh, throughout Mark. He does it. And then he sends his disciples out to do these three things. And then he commissioned his disciples to go into the world to do these three things. These three things are known as the Tria Munera, the threefold office of the priesthood. And that is the, the, the what's called the the munus docendi, the munus 
uh, sanctificandi and munus regendi. Those are Latin phrases that mean the, 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 the a munus is a, is a duty, a responsibility, an obligation, an office. Technically, it's an office, but it's also responsibility. It's something that the priesthood, this, these are three marks or duties of the, of the holy priesthood. And Jesus bestows on them. First, he does it himself, and then he goes out and sends the apostles out. And, and what is that? And Jesus goes out his very first day in Mark's gospel. He teaches, he heals, and then he drives out demons. So, so the, 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 the ministry of teaching the, that belongs properly to the local bishop. The ministry of healing we see, and that healing, ironically, the word that when Jesus healed all the sick, the word for sick, oftentimes, uh, sometimes it could be mental sickness, uh, 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 spiritual sickness, vice, as well as physical sickness. In fact, the word to save and to heal is often synonymous in the New Testament, and Jesus saved them, and Jesus healed them. And and then finally, the, 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 the ministry or the office of ruling, regende. This is where exorcism comes in. This is, falls into the juridical authority of the priest, the local priest. And this is, this is how uh, uh, um, Jesus sets out. He teaches, he heals, and he rules. And part of that ruling is ruling as, as the Lord God Almighty, as, as God the warrior who rules over the cosmic realm, as, as, as a warrior, as, a, as, as a, the leader of battle, who directs the heavenly host uh, um, beneath him to intercede and to help us in our own struggles. Now, going back to men, we, we, in a way, we share in that, not in the same way at all, not, not even close in essence or degree, it says in the council. Does our priesthood, is our priesthood, our priesthood is distinct from the, 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 the universal priesthood of the baptized, is distinct from the sacerdotal priesthood of, 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 the, of the ordained, but we, we also share in that in our homes. Men need to see themselves as teacher, right, as healer, and as as king or ruler uh, in the home, not not at the parish level, not 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 going out and, and holding prayer sessions in the basement of the church in your home, militating in these three threefold fashion. Um, that's very important for us to understand as men. But Jesus does this primarily. And, and then part of the Jesus who rules is is that title of God. Two phrases, the Lord God Almighty. The second phrase, the jealous God. I am a jealous God. The jealous God who, who, who commands fidelity, fidelity on behalf of his people. Yeah, Dan, that's fascinating. I mean, we, so often we, we get caught up with, you know, like the, I think we talked about last time we, we, we got together was, you know, like the Andrew Tates, the Jordan Petersons who have good things in mind for men, but it misses the fullness of what it means to be a man. So that, you know, they're all about discipline and and taking care of yourself in order and things like which is fantastic but again it there there's a step beyond that and that's exactly what Jesus brings out or should bring out of us exactly what you said the threefold mission of every man is to i wrote it down is is to teach to heal and to drive out demons you know and i think a lot of times too men think oh like education that's you know that's the mom's job or that's the wife's job it's like no absolutely not like you are the head of the household it is your responsibility to make sure what is being taught whether it's in the home or even outside the home is to make sure what is being taught um is in line with church teaching and then you know again as we talk about we are the tip of the spear when it comes to spiritual warfare in our own family so if we're not taking care of of ourselves then what do you think satan and his demons are going to do it's like oh this this family's vulnerable and he's going to get in, he's going to divide, and he's going to try to conquer us. Because, I mean, his goal is to get us to hell and every single part of our family. Because if he can get us away from the church, away from Jesus, then it's so much easier to go after the wife and the children because they are relying on us. And if we're not doing our duty, as you mentioned, then we're failing in our role as, as men. And I, I do want to talk about sin uh, as well and, and what that actually does to us. And I, I don't know if we really dove into it last time we met, but, you know, I think we often compare ourselves to, I don't know, the the worldly sinners, so to speak, like the public sinners, if you will. It's like, well, at least I'm not murdering someone or, hey, at least I'm not cheating on my wife. And again, that's another radical teaching of Jesus as well was he 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 goes way deeper than that. And he really challenges us like, no, if you commit adultery in your heart then it's the same as actually committing the act of adultery. And he talks about that frequently about sin. So can we talk about, and I'll kick this back to you, what does sin actually do 
to us, maybe even just physically, but also you know, if we dive into the difference between venial and mortal sin, what mortal sin actually does to our soul as well. Yeah, before we get into the sin, I want to because because um, the sins of the father, right? We you know um, they affect the children. They're going all the way back to Exodus, and and um, I will curse to the third and fourth generation, right? Due to the sins of the father, but to those who hate me. So there's there is a relationship between the sin that enters into the family through the sins of the father. And why is that? If you look at Father Ripperger's, when you look at Dominion. Um, and he's talking about what the phenomenon of generational curses. We probably shouldn't sidebar into that today, but that falls under the, the general topic of authority. Interestingly, contextualize it. This is where he contextualizes it because the authority structure, um, the authority structure is, uh, as you alluded to earlier, um, as uh, you know, it, it, it isn't based on merit. It isn't based on good looks. It isn't based upon uh, um, how well you can defend whether Jesus had brothers and sisters or not. It has nothing to do with that. The authority structure is it is set and is embedded into the natural law. Right. And also the divine positive law that the church uh, uh, that builds upon natural law. And part of the authority structure is, is men are head of households. And this is very unpopular today because we live in a very highly um, radical feminist culture, even the culture that's infiltrated the church in many ways. And so understanding the authority structure is now when people talk about spiritual combat and, and sometimes at parishes, I'll talk about Ephesians chapter six and what's embedded in, into Ephesians six. And our weapons are, you know, um, not against, we fight battle not against flesh and blood, etc. But Paul sets the stage for Ephesians six with Ephesians chapter five. Um, I think it's Ephesians 5, 28, you know, wives obey your husbands or be subordinate to your husbands in all things. Right. And so the, the, this is like very unpopular in the modern parish today. But if you look what that word means, he's getting ready to go into military, militaristic language, describing the uniform of the Roman legionnaire that, that would be occupying the town, the city of Ephesus and the uniforms that they would wear. And these would be the guys that are walking the streets, keeping order. OK, the uniforms put on the entire armor of God and describes the shield, the 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 the, 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 the sword, the, et cetera. And, and he spiritualizes them in a midrashic way, if you will. And he explains what they mean in spiritual combat. But even before he gets to that, he uses another military term here in Ephesians 5, be, 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 be subordinate to that word uh, obey is to be literally means to be ordered under the Greek word upotasso. We get the Latin would be sub uh, uh, ordinatio, right? To be ordered under. And literally it's a military term that means to be under the protection of under the provision of embedded into that word is the twofold ends of the authority structure. If, if you are, are in authority, whether as a priest or as a layman of head of household, or even on the authority, even by natural law and in, in your work environment or your, your business that you own, you have a twofold obligation within the office, right? Of head of household. Remember it's office. It's a munus. It's an office. And the twofold ends of that are to provide and to pr protect. And so, and so it's as if the, 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 you know, God has given the husband and father a shield and a sword spiritually, and his job is to take his wife and his children and place them behind that, uh, behind him, holds up his shield, holds up his, his gladius, his sword, and he defends in the spiritual realm. And he, he's the first to engage the enemy. He's the first to recognize. He's the first to teach. He's the first to protect. This is the role. This is this is all that that is embedded into that word. It's a militaristic term. And so what the when you so the connection with sin is, and the way the way the the way the Romans would work. He, Paul describes the, the 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 sword, the gladius. But before they would break out the gladius, the first thing they would do is throw the the pila, p i l a pila. The pila was about a it was about eleven or twelve feet long uh, 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 spear, and it had it had a heavy metal tip. And then it had a heavy tip on the back, a small little tip on the backside that was metal so that when it when they, they could pick it up in the battlefield and use it as, a, as a, just an improvised weapon. In between these two halves, it was held together with a wooden shaft, a, a wooden a wooden bolt. So that bolt was meant to sever and they would throw this this spear out, this pila, and the enemy would would have to hold their shield up and it would penetrate into the shield, right? Because you had wooden shields back then. It would penetrate into the wooden shield and then that wooden that wooden screw would snap and it would hang there. So you had about 11 pounds hanging there, hanging off your shield. And you, and you had to make a decision. Do I drop my shield 
and fight without a shield? Or do I use my right hand to hold my shield up and fight with, and fight defensively without a sword? And so he knocks, he, he basically effectively minimizes your battle capacity. And then he comes in with the sword. And the enemy still does that. The enemy comes in and he hammers us with the, with the, with the first round, the volley, if you will, of to lower our shields. And so men need to keep that shield raised up because the target isn't the target isn't you per se. The target is first the marriage. If he can divide the marriage and separate you from your wife, then he can go after the children because the children ultimately are the target. So the, the so and how does he divide the husband and the wife? What is the the pila? Uh what is the what what does it look like? He begins to separate you first getting you to stop praying together. Even the minor little ways of just saying grace together, praying the rosary together, um, you know, praying, praying the Angelus together. Praying together is very important. Doesn't have to be anything mystical and kung fu y and exciting. Very simple vocal prayers together. And then he starts to change and whittle away at our perceptions of each other. And once he starts those two, that's sort of his tactics. And once he can divide the husband and the wife, she's now no longer under his direct protection. She's now outside of his shield. And so the children are as well. And so that that's why sin is important, because when you commit a sin, particularly a sin of head of, as a head of household, when you're looking at pornography as a man, um, you've taken your sword and your shield, you've laid them aside. You preoccupied yourself with this immoral behavior. And now that you've been neutralized, the Pila has now taken down your shield and your family who are, who are, who are by natural law under your protection are no longer protected. Yeah, I just the the military. I mean, you can't help but look at you know the the terms of the military in, in relation to this fight that we're in, especially as men. You know, and just like with the Pila, like you said, and 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 transitioning that into the spiritual combat, spiritual warfare, what Satan is always trying to do, and, and I think I'm referred to it earlier, is he just wants to divide and conquer us. And I know you talked about this last time too, the importance of order, uh, especially as men. As heads of how, as the head of the household, is if your life is not in order, like you said, if you're looking at pornography, if you're, you know, just watching sports or scrolling social media all day long, you're not, you're not diving into the spiritual life. You're not uh, expanding on your your spiritual life and your relationship with Jesus. Then you're failing in your role as a man, in your duty and your obligation as a man, because everything we have is from God, and He put us. Whatever your dynamic is, whatever your situation is with your, whether you're married, you're not married, whatever the case might be, Jesus put you in that situation for a reason. And you are here at this time and the place, whenever you're listening to this, whatever situation you're currently in right now, Jesus will provide the resources to either get out of it or to improve upon or whatever the case might be. But th- th- again, it goes back to what Jesus always tells the people that he heals is is go and sin no more. But you have to put forth the effort to change whatever the case might be. Whatever you're in, whatever you're struggling with, you have to put forth the effort. I know when we had to reschedule last time, Dan, and I, I called you because there was a lot going on in my life. And, you know, you, you gave me good advice. You're like, hey, man, you got to embrace the suck. And I know we talked yeah. about that last time is, you know, because sometimes it you get in your own head. And that's why I love, you know, chatting with you is that like, hey, man, you just you just got to embrace the suck because there is virtue that comes from it. And this isn't forever. We always go through consolation and desolation. And it's that roller coaster. And whatever you're in desolation is bear down, grit it out, because there's there's going to be tremendous power and grace that comes at the tail end of it. But you got to you got to suck it up and you got to embrace it because. What else can you do as a man? This is the fight that we're in, and we're never going to be in this perfect world until we get to heaven, Lord willing. Yeah, what's, what's interesting, you mentioned, you mentioned Jordan Peterson. He's got a brilliant mind. I think he's moving his way towards Catholicism. Oh, for um, sure. Because he's too smart. Because, you know, Flannery O'Connor said that Catholicism is filled, the Catholic churches are filled with freaks and geeks, you know? And, <laughs> and, uh, and so, and so it, it attracts the geek, you know? The, by freaks, she means, you know, the marginalized, the poor, right. the, you know, uh, but it also attracts these brilliant minds like Jordan Peterson. And he's talking what if we could translate what he's talking about, making your bed, the order and discipline. These are w- what we would call natural remedies of combat. These are very important that, that, you know, most guys say, oh, man, I want to be a Green Beret. I want to be Ranger. You know, I want to be a, a you know special ops guy. I want the tab and all these things. 
But all those guys have mastered the basic skills first before they go. And then and go to the next level from basic soldiering to special operations. The battle is right here. The battle is in your head. Um, a, a friend of mine was a, he's a retired a Green Beret colonel. And a, a Marine was going through the Q course. And he kept asking every phase. he would. The Q, the Q course is the qualification course for the Green Berets. And they asked him, he kept asking, this Marine kept saying, okay, after this phase, what do I do? After this phase, what do I do? How do I get through this phase? I think the guy never made it. The guy ended up never making it all the way through. Um, hmm. uh, and my buddy says, look, if you want to make it through, through the special forces Q course, here's, here's what you need to do. Keep your head down, keep your mouth shut and keep walking. And, and that's great advice for men. Just keep your head down, keep your mouth shut and keep walking because it, you know, it's going to come, the, the, the battle is going to come, and then you're going to have a law, and then there's going to be peace, and then there's going to be a lot of fun, and then it's going to rain, and then it's going to be muddy, and then it's going to be nasty, and then they're going to be trying to kill you again, and then you're going to be shooting back, you know, and it's just, but so you just, you just get through it, you just keep your head down, keep your mouth shut, and keep walking, and what does that mean? Going back to Jordan Peterson, the natural remedies means you have to impose order in your life. That, that here's what we found in our protocol. This is this is this is what we found discovered over the years that the enemy responds to the imposition of order as much as to the prayers themselves. The whole idea of the pila is to disrupt the ranks, the orders of the enemy is to break his ranks. Because once the once the rank breaks, then the heavy infantry would move in. Uh, the, the Roman legionnaire would move in in an extremely ordered way, not moving. The 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 the, uh, the, the centurion would sit in the back, and he would have a, a, a we would call it a swagger stick, you know, which was made um, from you know you're in Italy where the, where, where there's good wine, right? It was made out of a vine, a vinea. It was it was it was made out of a out of a vine branch, so it could bend like this and not snap. And so if anybody broke ranks. The centurion would 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 bash him in the back in the bare part of the back of the legs. Stay in the ranks. Stay in order because order is absolutely important to the way the Romans fought, and this is why they could defeat far larger enemies. And if we know that, we fight an ancient enemy, and and there's certain battle uh, corollaries between combat, spirit, physical combat, and spiritual combat. That order is very important. You know, when I was a kid, like many like many people my generation, we loved Hulk Hogan. Right. I was a Hulkamania. Oh, yes. He was fantastic. And he would always say to young people, listen, kids, you know, and by the way, the wrestlers today, they couldn't light a candle to to the old guys, you know, Hulk and, and, and Ric Flair and Dusty Rhodes. And these guys were giants. So this is what Hulk Hogan said. If you want to be a Hulkamaniac, eat your vitamins, uh, uh, exercise, do your workout every day and say your prayers, you know. And, and so and so there really is a certain amount of truth to that. We, we tend to want to say, I need that special weapon, that special prayer, that secret prayer so I can launch this thing like Iron Man shoots a little missile out of his thing and walks away and goes home and has a has a cocktail. That's not true combat. True combat is a grind. It's a grind. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes you, you blow up an enemy depot spot and you head back to the officer's club. But other times it's trench warfare. And oftentimes when you're when 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 guys find themselves in a battle understand that yeah spiritual combat takes on the it, it, it is mirrored it somehow mirrors natural combat and sometimes natural combat is trench warfare and you just got to grind it out you just got to grind it out is it hulk hogan isn't he a pretty strong christian i, I think, think so. i saw him yeah i think i saw him on the joe uh, maybe it's just a clip on the joe rogan podcast and i saw uh he spoke about i think he invited joe rogan to church i think yeah. but a little side yeah, yeah, there. Jesse told me that one time he ran into into Hulk on uh, uh, on an airplane, and he was wearing this big, huge crucifix. And he said, and he said, "Hey, man, nice crucifix." So I don't think he's fully Catholic, but I think he's I think he's, he's on his uh, way. He's on, on his way. way. Yeah, get yeah, the Hulk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I do, I do want to mention because we we brought up uh, Jordan Peterson a couple times the importance of order, but the importance of discipline too, and. I've been listening to, uh, I'm sure you've heard of Jocko Willink, who was uh -huh. a, a U.S. Navy SEAL. I mean, he's all about discipline equals freedom. Uh, that's that's kind of his motto. And, you know, looking at the Gospels, you see how disciplined Jesus was as well. Because what did he do before he even entered public ministry is he went into the desert for 40 days for fasting and for prayer. What does he always calls to do? He mentioned to, the God, to his disciples where he said, 
you know, they tried to drive out a demon. Uh, I forget which gospel, but they couldn't. And they said, hey, Jesus, why couldn't we drive him out? He has some demons that are only driven out by prayer and fasting. And, you know, he recognized, too, the importance of secluding himself to sort of recharge. Because um, certain parts, he said, you know, disciples, go ahead, go on ahead of me. I'm going to go to the mountains and pray, or I'm just going to go and pray. And he said that multiple times in the Gospels. And the discipline that he had, because um, recognizing as a human, the weaknesses that we have, uh, especially weaknesses of the flesh, and the importance of that discipline. I mentioned Jocko Willink as well, and they're all about no matter what you do is you need to exercise because everything else in your life will get better. Your your business, your 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 career, your um, just your your health, obviously as well. But uh, just correlating back that back to Jesus is how much discipline that he had and the importance of that too. Because like you said, Dan is sometimes it's going to be. You know, you, you shoot a missile and it blows up and you can go back and it's, it's one and done. It's super quick. But most of the time it is that trench warfare. And if you think about trench warfare, especially like the World War One, um, I remember reading All Quiet on the Western Front and it was, you know, it was just back and forth. You know, like you gain 10 feet and then you you lost five feet and then you gained two feet and then you lost six feet. You know, it's just back and forth. And that's, that's going to happen in the spiritual battle as well, because it is that grind because we are human and we do become tired and fatigued. And it's recognizing and 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 instituting that discipline that we need every single day in order to defeat the missiles that are constantly being fired at us about the demons and, and Satan himself. Well, St. Paul uses the analogy in Ephesians 6 that put up faith as a shield. And so we often think of, yeah, to, 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 uh, to, to, to quench the smoldering arrows of the enemy, right? These arrows that are on fire. You talk about about an analogy for impure thoughts, the enemy's just firing fiery arrows at us, you know, co- dipped in pitch and lit little light to, 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 to try to burn our shield down, right? But part of the, 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 the way the Romans used the shield um, was it had, a, it had a boss on the front in the middle of the shield, a big steel ball with a spike. And so the shield wasn't just a defensive measure, you know, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. You know what I mean? The shield was an offensive weapon as well. But before they, the pila came first, and then the infantry moved in. Okay, the infantry moved in. After the in, 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 the infantry moves in, uh, and once they engaged, they didn't start slashing like 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 the Gauls and 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 the the, the Germans and others. Um, they would they would first that line would come up heavy, strong, disciplined, and they would pound into the enemy with the shield and knock them off their feet to lower their shield and then they would come in with the with the the gladius and start slicing and cutting and wounding and then just moving on like a buzzsaw so so that that keeping that shield up and and if paul says it's a, it's a weapon of faith how do we use it not just defensively but offensively how do we use our that offensively jesus shows us it's called mental prayer it's called lexio divina so so men have to start to learn how to pray right um, the, you know, there's three types of prayer, basically, in Catholic tradition. Um, you have vocal prayer, which is, you know, we've got the deliverance prayers for use by the laity. My book, I've used a lot of those, those uh, in the Libra Cristo manual. I've, you know, we've brought those, those prayers over, how to pray those prayers at what time. That's very important. But then mental prayer, um, you know, sometimes it's called meditation, but mental prayer um, it's using the mind in, a, in, in using the imagination, meditating upon the words of Scripture, slow reading. When Jesus was tempted by the devil and the devil throws Scripture at him, Jesus throws Scripture right back. You should not put the Lord God to your test. You're not, you're not, man doesn't live by bread alone. These are classic temptations against us that all men are going to face, right? We face, this is kind of a pattern Jesus is showing us. This is how the demon is going to tempt you the world, the flesh, the devil, and this is how we counter back through Scripture, by reading Scripture, meditating on the life of Scripture. This is why meditation, reading, slow reading, daily reading of Scripture is extremely important because it starts to reorder our interior selves um, to be able to do combat, because combat takes place right here. It, 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 it takes place in, in the faculties, in, in, in the mind. And so getting the mind disciplined and through a prayer, a life order to prayer, not just praying a couple secret prayers, right? It doesn't work that way. 
you got to get the mind, you got, you know, you got to get your dirt out of the warden's hole, right? You got to get your mind right. So that, how do you get your mind right? Through prayer. St. Catherine of Siena, doctor of the church says this, everybody should pray at least 30 minutes a day, unless you're busy. And she said, uh, and then you should pray for an hour. So, and so what does that look like? Vocal prayers, prayers for your family, stringing down concertina wire, laying, laying the perimeter in the, in the, in the, in my book, I, I use the analogy of the wire. The wire is the, the, would string together claymore mines. And those mines became the protective perimeter. You got to lay those down for your own interiority, but also laying them down for your family. Perimeters, prayers of protection, uh, of perimeter prayers. Uh, uh, um, other prayers that you should pray every day to protect your family. That's vocal prayer, but then also moving into mental prayer, uh, learning that the, the tradition of the, the Western tradition on prayer is very important. Reading about the lives of the saints, St. Teresa, we just celebrated John of the Cross yesterday. How do we do mental prayer? It's something we, we have to do. And one last thing, learning what G, the words of Jesus when, when the, the disciples couldn't drive the demon out, uh, uh, of the boy that was possessed, uh, and Jesus drives him out, and they ask him, "Why couldn't we do it?" And Jesus says, "This type only comes out through prayer and fasting." So it isn't just this intellectual thing that I'm doing. I'm battling sword fight with my brain and my thoughts and my intellect because you'll lose. You're, you're dealing with a creature, an apex predator that that is, that has an intellect that is far superior far, far exceedingly superior to yours. Even the lowest demon of the lowest intellect is a hundred times more intelligent than you and I. So you're not going to battle him here. But how do we do that? We do it with what St. Uh, um, Faustina says, the envy of the angels, right? If the angels could envy us, if they were capable of envy, she said, they would envy us for two things. One is that we can receive Holy Communion, that we can bodily receive our God. That should tell us something. Right, that we should we should we should receive God every day if possible in the Holy Eucharist. We should stop and have a Eucharistic uh, a, a touch every single day, going to adoration, even in fifteen minutes, um, to pray the Rosary before the Blessed Sacrament. And then also the the second thing they would envy is our ability to suffer. So if you're bat if you're doing battle in your home, it's not just going to be I need to come up with a special prayer. It's also engaging with your body, engaging with fasting. Right. Um, I've, I've heard that in session, the demon will, will call the team members out and say, none of you guys are fasting. I'm not going anywhere. Oh, so, gosh. yeah. And this is consistent with with uh, a new book uh, that Tan just put out on an exorcism from a, I think it was about a generation ago from the 50s. And the demon said, I'm not going anywhere because your bishop doesn't fast. So so and fasting takes more than just the lack of food. It's engaging with our bodies. You can fast from hot water. You can fast from sweet little creamer. So you turn your morning coffee into milkshake, right? You can fast from coffee. You can fast from a lot of things. It's engaging with the body while we can, using our bodies as, as weapons of righteousness, if you will. And so that, that's, part of, that's part of the order of prayer as well. It's being able to make small little sacrifices for your family. That's a dimensionality of warfare that nobody, nobody it's kind of lost, right? But we, we need to recap, recapture that. Dan, can you hold up your deliverance book one more time? Yeah. Look at that. Look at that tatter. Oh, no, the, the, uh, the deliverance prayers. Look at that. That is a well-used book, my friend. For those of you who are just listening, it is just torn to pieces, basically, because it's used so yeah. much. So it's a, it, it's a well-used book. It, it's got some holster wear, if you will. It's been, it's been, <laughs> it's been taken downrange and used in, in, uh, in, whole, in righteous anger. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Dan, Again, it's you know, secret. It's a secret. You just it's just it's a grind, you know? It's just a grind. You know, like we yeah. used to have friends in the military, welcome to the suck. You just yeah. you know, welcome to the suck. The suck is the combat zone. It's the discomfort of, of of combat, the discomfort of food, the discomfort of sleeping on the ground, the discomfort of of people on the other side that want to do really bad things to you, you know? Um but it's but it's it, but 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 the second phrase is embrace it. Embrace the mm. suck. That means you grab onto it. You say, yeah, it's okay. I love it here. I wish it would suck more. I love it here. It's great, you know? And so I, would... I think I mentioned that cartoon that was in all the flight, you know, and all the, all the, all the flight, the flight line everywhere I was stationed. Cause I was a pilot, you know? Yeah. And it shows, it shows an army grunt, um, in the rain up to his waist in mud. And, it, and the first caption, it just shows this basic soldier. It says it sucks out here. Right. The next picture is, is a ranger. 
he's got his, you know, he's got his Ranger boonie cap. He's, he's all, he's all Rangered out, tricked out. He says, uh, uh, it sucks out here. I love it when it sucks out here. And then it goes to the, the green beret tiger stripe paint on his, you know, uh, 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 camo, uh, boonie cap geared up, standing in the same mud, same rain. It sucks out here. I love it when it sucks out here. I wish it would suck more. Right. And then the next one, it shows a, a Cobra pilot inside the perfectly airtight canopy. And it says, man, it looks like it really sucks out there. So, so yeah, you, it, nobody likes it. It would be inhuman to want this, you know, but the Rangers and the SF guys, they get it. The airborne guys, uh, they get it. Uh, the paratroopers, you know, I also went to, you know, paratrooper school and they taught us this. How far are we going to go all the way? Because we don't know. You know, when, when the army sets out and says, look, we're going to do a three mile run or five mile run, you can put it into your head that, yeah, I can do this. I can run five miles. And the minute you go more than five miles, you'll start watching guys drop because they put it in their head. I'll go five miles, but no more. And so the airborne motto is how far all the way you go hmm. all, as far as you have to go. So if you're if you're in a, a, a firefight in your home over your marriage, your children or whatever. Don't just think, oh, man, all I got to do is if I can just grind this out for six months and do these set prayers, th th then I'm good. Because once those six months ends, and, I, and I've seen this training fighters, I can drop this guy in, in two rounds. Well, what happens if he makes it through the second? It's like, man, I guess I, I, I might as well quit. You got to be prepared to go the distance. How long it 100%. takes, however long it takes. And that's just part of the, 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 the grind. Of, of combat and part of that is not complaining because suddenly when you're complaining you have more to complain about you know it, you know when you're complaining about the about how horrible it is over here you fight you remember remember that, that i put this in my book um the quote from chesterton the true soldier fights not because he hates what's in front of him because he loves but because he loves what's standing behind him and so you have to engage combat, not because I hate what the enemy is doing to my family. I hate the embarrassment it brings to me. I hate that he's messing with my marriage or whatever. You do it because you love your family. You do it out of love for them. And so if, you, if you're struggling with pornography, quit because you love your family. Not because, you, and, and, and don't let the enemy draw you into hating him. But out of love, for, out of love and obligation, do you, do you overcome these vices that are afflicting you? Yeah, and I know we mentioned your book a couple times. I'm just going to post it up here. So it's the Libra Cristo Method, a field manual for spiritual combat. And you did mention too, Dan, a little bit ago, you know, Lectio Divina. And for some of our listeners, this might be the first time they're hearing that term. Do you mind just briefly explaining and walking through like what is Lectio Divina? Yeah, Lectio is a Benedictine concept. Here's my my morning coffee. Is yes, my love it. Hope so, there's no cream in that, Dan. There's no cream, man. You know, there's no, that was pure black grinds. Yeah, that was it. That was army coffee. Chewing so, on the beans. That's it. No, it was, yeah. Yeah. It, actually, at Ranger School, we would, uh, and I think about this sometimes when I get, when I feel a little soft, you know, when I'm feeling like, oh, man, I need a little more time in bed. I need a little more, you know, hot water in the shower. At Ranger, at Army Ranger School, we would, just, just to get through, you didn't have, you didn't even, start, there were times we would go days without stopping. But, you know, no sleep, no, no stopping. You just walk for, I remember walking for five days straight, literally walking for five days straight, no sleep. And, uh, and so you would get a little, little coffee packets about this big and you would just, you know, throw the dry powder in and then the, your canteen is filled with river water. You wash it down with river water and then don't waste the grounds, take the grounds and stick them into the corner of your eyes to keep your eyes open. You know, now if I can do that, if I can do that for, for, the, for the, a worldly king and a worldly, why can I not do that and have that level of sacrifice for Jesus Christ, the king of king and lord of the lords, the Lord God Almighty, God the warrior, right? And Our Lady, the warrior queen, making those little sacrifices. Soldiers do this. You want to be an SF guy? That's the stuff. You got to be willing to do that. You know, you got to be willing, you got to be willing to do whatever it takes to win your battle as long as it takes. So the same thing in the family. So what was the question again? Sorry, I got, I got. Uh, no, that's all right. Lectio Divina. Do you mind uh, explaining that a little bit for those? Well, yeah. So Lectio Divina, um, Lectio, Lectio Divina means divine or sacred, holy readings. And it's a four phase process. Um, uh, Lectio, uh, Meditatio, Oratio, Contemplatio. Those are the four phases. It's so prayer. I mean, read, meditate, 
pray, contemplate. So it's a slow reading. It isn't this speed reading. You're going to read a chapter a day, you know, no, you're going to read a scripture and you're going to hammer down one short little segment and you're going to really just read and meditate, read on it and then start meditating, placing yourself there and, or start making connections. You know, uh, um, how, where else is this word mentioned in scripture? Where else is this? So you start linking together, you know, um, the ancient principle from the rabbis and St. Augustine fleshes it out further. Scripture is the best interpreter of scripture. So you don't need to have all these commentaries. What you need is to keep scripture open. And where else has this word been used? What's going on? Where is he when he's saying this? Place yourself at the scene. You're starting to use your mind in engaging with the imagination. Um, un, un, turning up every rock. Slow reading. And then praying, right? Read, meditate, pray. And contemplate. So then you're starting to start praying and you start applying this to you. Uh, 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 and so the three elements of mental prayer, and Lexio Divine is a type of mental prayer, is consideration, application, resolution, car, right? You consider the mystery. What are you studying? What are you reading? What, what's the story? What's happening here? Uh, a, a applied. How does this apply to me? Right? How does this apply to me? And then resolution. Uh, what am I going to do about it? So, so you're going into the mysteries, you're reading scripture, you, this is how it applies uh, to me. This is like, wow, yeah, yeah, you know, um, uh, the wedding feast at Cana, the, the whatever, whatever you're meditating on. And then what am I going to do about it? it? It's not enough just to say, that's cool. I uncovered some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, that, that applies today. And maybe I'll write an article for that or do a podcast for that. No, what is, how is this going to change me? And then contemplatio, contemplation is, it's and then you and then at times very rarely okay god begins to kind of drive the bus for a while and he begins to 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 you begin to sit in his presence just be silent before him so the idea is to begin by doing the grunt work and then some of the mental work of of meditating on the passage connecting it through prayer lord there's no more wine i'm out i've got no more wine I got no wine of charity. I got no wine to defend myself against these assaults, uh, these temptations. I'm completely empty. The, sto the stone jars are, are empty and they're, and, they're, and, they're, and they're cracking and they're leaking. Help me, Lord. You know, and you cry out to God and then make resolution. And you trust that God's going to do that, that God's going to fill it up. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. So that's the four steps. Uh, Pope Benedict in his book, Verbum Domini, added a fifth, and that is action, axio. And it isn't like, let's go out and be social justice warriors, right? It, it, you know, uh, it's action. What am I going to do about it? How is this going to change my life, right? How is it going to change me? Am I going to be kinder to my wife and to my children? Not just kinder. Am I going to be present to them? Am I going to truly listen to my wife when she speaks? Right? Am I going to be too preoccupied about all the obligations and responsibilities that I've had throughout today? Am I going to shut down and put a time clock, in, a visible time clock in my kitchen? And when I get home from work, punch in and go to work, roll up your sleeves, right? Help, help around the house, be present to your family, right? This is, this is the commitment of action, you know? And if God calls you to do other things in the apostolate, so be it. But that axio first and foremost is a, is a spiritual action. How is this going to apply to me? And how's, what, what am I going to put into place to, to, make, to, to, to actualize the fruit of what I've just read in Holy Scripture? Yeah, for those of you listening, there's tons of resources out there as well. And I'll put a couple in the show notes just so you guys can look it up. If, you know, cause there's, I know there's uh, websites they'll give you passages to kind of start off with, especially the more like prominent ones where it's easy to kind of insert yourself into the scene or to meditate on. So I'll put some resources in there for you. And but this Dana, is why, what? Why we, in our protocol, um, that that for the first phase, the prayer discipline, and you can look it up on. We've got it uh, on the App Store. It's a 30 day discipline, not not unlike uh, Exodus 90. In fact, it's a lot easier than Exodus 90. And guys that do Exodus 90 come back transformed because they're learning how to they're learning how to engage with their bodies. Because again, if you're just going to try to do mental judo, you're talking about a judoko far superior than you'll ever be. You'll never be at the level to compete with this guy here, this, this diabolic judoko, but you can beat him with your body. And so, so, so the first 30 days is, is a, is a, is a, is a mental 
uh, um, it also has a mental component, not just praying 6, 12 and 6, the Angelus and a couple of other prayers, but also pulling back from social media as good as this podcast is and other things. Um, you're pulling back for 30 days and all you're going to do is read the scriptures. You know, I tell people you can read anything you want so long as it's t- today's mass readings. And you're going to focus, you're going to plug into the liturgical calendar because it's through the liturgy that church catechizes. The primary instrument of catechesis is liturgy, right? Catechesis, the catecheo means to sound down, to echo downward, right? And so, and so, the, and so we, when we put our ear into the tradition of the church, the liturgical tradition, it echoes back through liturgy. And this is how we, God catechizes us. So learning to do, even if you're just going to do the daily mass readings, Pick them up and do that as your as your lexio as your as your fifteen minutes of quiet prayer, reading about those, and it'll begin to interconnect. God will begin to speak to us through Scripture. He He talks to us through repetition. And I'm not talking about mystical revelations and oh, I'm going to have this. No, I'm not talking about all that fancy stuff, man. We're talking about just reading Scripture and go and God going, dude, knock that off, dude. You need to live your life a little. Stop living like a pagan. Stop, stop, stop pretending that you're, you know, how long are you going to straddle the fence? Oh, Israel, if God is God, follow him. If not, if Baal is God, follow him, says Elijah. You know, God is constantly calling us to that, to the words of, like the words of Elijah. If God is God, follow him. Don't act like it doesn't matter. And so that, that's what I'm talking about. Those little, little socks to the, you know, little, little love taps, you know, doesn't quite draw blood, but it kind of it hurts a little bit. Doesn't leave a mark. a little bit. Yeah, that, that's what prayer, that's what God is in his gentleness. Sometimes, sometimes he gives you a shot, you know, because you got, he's got to learn. You've got to learn. He, he wants you to survive this combat. You and those he's entrusted into your care. Yeah, so I guess for my final question for you, Dan, what is maybe the biggest misconception about Jesus or the biggest takeaway that especially men can take away from Jesus's example here on earth that maybe the culture has sort of, yeah, sugar coated or can maybe completely taken away from his character itself. Yeah, you know, St. Paul tells us in Hebrews that he was like us in all things but sin. So Jesus, sometimes we can picture Jesus so completely other that we can't identify with him. He called guys just like us, knuckleheads. You know what I mean? Guys that would argue and disagree with stuff. You know, the apostles. He was a regular man's man. He was a carpenter. He worked with his hands. You know, he was a manly guy. Um, but he also was demanding, you know, if you wish to be my disciple, three things, deny yourself daily, pick up your cross daily and follow me daily. We are conformed as men specifically. We are conformed to Christ and to, into that, to pick up our cross, to deny ourselves, pick up our cross and, and follow him specifically through the, our vocational sacrament. And so, and so, so. Um, this idea, and then we get it, you know, we hear it all over the, all over the place and church and Jesus is again, the sugary Jesus, the nice guy, Jesus, who's kind of like Alan Alda from mass. He's a super nice guy. He doesn't offend. Um, read the book of revelation. You know, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same God that fed water from the rock, the same warrior God, Lord God almighty, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday day and forever then the rock was christ saint paul says in first corinthians 10 so enter and trust and follow the life of christ go into that don't just understand christ as a concept but truly begin to 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 pray and and engage him in prayer lord come help me i'm getting my butt kicked down here you know help me out pray to him like you talk talk to him like a man right not not like a concept because he is a man fully god fully man Right. And so and so live like he lived. Right. And which means he lived for others because we, we, we like to look at Ephesians six, Ephesians five, women's obey your women, obey your husbands. And, I, you know, the guys, we, we hear that at mass. We give a little nudge. But the second half of that, St. Paul says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church handing himself over the word he uses agape. We hear all about love, love, love. This is what agape means. It means sacrifice, sacrificial love. This is a love unique to Christianity, a love unique to Jesus Christ, a sacrificial love. Love knows uh, um, uh, um, the, no greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. So St. Paul says in Ephesians 5, lay down your lives. As Christ died for the church, you die for your wife. That's the Jesus that I follow. That's, the, that's how we, we militate. That's how we are warriors 
and defending our home, but willing to die for our, our wives and our children. That's what St. Paul is calling us to. It's a lot easier for, for the call of the woman is a lot easier than the call of the man. We're called to die. We're called to die to ourselves completely. And it's hard. It goes against our very nature. And, and so Christ, though, transforms our nature so that we can now enter into that sacrificial posture or willing to offer up our sufferings for, for our families. Well, thank you, Dan, as always, for your time, that call to action for men. Again, if you want to check out Dan's book, from Tan Books, The Libra Crystal Method, I'll put a link in the show notes and a, also a little coupon code for you guys. You can get discount off and also help support the podcast. But Dan, before I let you go, I would be remiss to say uh, go blue uh, as they beat your beloved Buckeyes uh, uh, last, I last I month. I appreciate the, the, the time of... Uh, the, you, I had to. You, you, the time of mourning, you honored that. And mm. I, and, and, uh, but what happened to Florida State and, and they got oh. bumped, you have, to, you have to, even as a Buckeye fan, I have to say, and I'll probably make some enemies here, but I think I have to, I have to root for Michigan over Alabama in this bowl game. Ooh. You got to root for Michigan. Yes. So, uh, okay. Yeah. And, you know what? Say what you want about Harbaugh. He's a pro life guy and he's able to beat the Buckeyes, not even on the sidelines. So you got to give him props for that. And, uh, and I, and I, and, uh, I appreciate what Jim Harbaugh does as a Catholic man living his faith. Not afraid, you know, I appreciate 100%. that. Well, yeah, you yeah. know, I, I was actually talking to my, my family too. And it's like, you know, I don't think it's ironic or a coincidence that um, after he gave this big, you know, pro-life talk and I think in the summertime or before the football season starts, all of a sudden, all this stuff is starting to come out. Like, I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's a coincidence that like all of a sudden, like, let's go after Michigan. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and they got to find, they got a really fine football team this year. So uh, they've been really progressing. And so, yeah, I, I, I hope they beat Alabama and the Irish, we have, uh, uh, Oregon state. So I, I think the Irish are going to do okay. We'll see. You never know, but we're, we're, we're entering into bowl season, which is always fun. Uh, I appreciate you not, not harassing me too much and you respected never. the time of mourning, uh, after the, after the loss, uh, to the school of North and, uh, but yeah, so I, I but I appreciate it. And, 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 uh, but it's good. It's good. But see, he, he's a good witness. So men need not be afraid to, to speak their mind. 100%. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Well, Dan, thank you again for your time. Thank you all so much for listening. Until next time, go out there and be a saint.